Welcome to Professionalism and Customer Service in the Healthcare Environment, Customer Service in Health IT. In this lecture, we'll learn about measuring health IT customer service. The objectives for this lecture are to discuss different metrics used to measure health IT customer service, discuss effective strategies for health IT implementations, and discuss different go-live approaches and their implications. Although health IT services are extremely important, they do not directly generate revenue for an organization. They are an expense. Healthcare organizations want to know that they're getting the best results for the money they spend. They also want to know that their customers are satisfied during health IT implementations. It's imperative then for IT departments to demonstrate their value by measuring the services they provide and determining the return on investment. The following slides explore several of the metrics currently used by IT departments in healthcare settings. Comparison of services against targets outlined in service level agreements. Analysis of help desk metrics. Achievement of project management goals and milestones. Satisfactory completion of obligations outlined in vendor contracts and customer satisfaction surveys. A service level agreement is an agreement between a customer and service provider. It specifies the type and level of services that will be provided. For example, if IT staff at a healthcare organization were considering vendors to provide cloud services, they might want to see items such as the following covered in the service level agreement. Are there metrics regarding unplanned downtime that we can access? Is there a financial penalty for downtime? How often are backups performed? For how long are the backup histories maintained? A service level agreement is often called an SLA and can be a key tool in helping to manage and even elevate customer satisfaction levels. In a healthcare setting, this type of service agreement is used primarily in heavy end user interaction settings, such as help desk services. The level of service guaranteed to users of the help desk may be that all calls will be answered by the fourth ring, one level of customer satisfaction, that all calls will be triaged on the phone, and that one-third of all issues will be resolved over the first phone call, the second level of service. Calls that need to be farmed out to the desktop support team or the network services team may be guaranteed to be addressed within 24 hours, the third level of service. The turnaround time of each level of service must be closely monitored because the help desk provider is under pressure to adhere to the agreed upon service level or face potential consequences. The next two slides are examples of the metrics that are closely monitored by an IT help desk and reported on a monthly basis. This chart shows the volume of calls handled and the maximum time of customers waited for their call to be answered. You can see that the wait time increased during the third week of this month, despite a call volume that was lower than the previous week. Further investigation into this performance issue may be needed. This line graph shows the volume of calls by day of week and the percentage of calls that were abandoned by customers, that is, the customer hung up before the call was answered by a help desk technician. According to this chart, the highest number of calls occurred on Monday and the highest number of abandoned calls occurred on this same day. Other metrics include measuring against acceptance criteria outlined in project management documents such as project charters, scope statements, schedules, and quality plans. IT staff need to obtain input from all project stakeholders, for example, end users of the system being implemented or modified. These could include physicians, nurses, administrators, and so on. IT staff should articulate their understanding of the stakeholders' needs and expectations back to the stakeholders to ensure clear understanding. This is accomplished in various project management documents that detail needs and expectations and must be agreed to by the stakeholders. Subsequent performance is then evaluated against the deliverables, schedule, level of quality, budget, and acceptance criteria outlined in the project plan. Were the agreed upon deliverables achieved satisfactorily? on time and within budget? Quality management best practice dictates that quality will be built into every single stage or phase of a project. As an example, let's consider how quality can be ensured during a project to replace aging mobile computer workstations that clinical staff are currently using in a hospital. Comprehensive testing procedures of health IT systems should be established and systematically implemented. 
First, the IT team verifies that the software, such as applications, virus protection, and tools, is properly loaded on the workstation. Next, the software is tested to ensure it provides the functionality required by the clinicians. Then the performance of the workstation on the hospital's secure wireless network is checked. Hardware should be inspected before it's taken to a unit and deployed and tested again during the auditing process. In this example project, the new workstations would be inspected to ensure they are clean, free of any packing materials, and equipped with a working barcode scanner before they are deployed to the hospital unit. They would also be tagged for proper asset management. Meetings with stakeholders can be invaluable in rating the perceived level of quality of a project. Any stakeholder who believes that quality is suffering should be taken seriously. The concerns should be documented and managed as a risk to the project's success until the customer or stakeholder is satisfied. Managing this risk would be accomplished by including stakeholders in the early testing of the new mobile workstations. Documenting in the contract all of the details, such as deliverables, schedules, costs, and acceptance criteria, prior to contract execution is critical. Contracted services should then be constantly monitored to ensure they align with agreed-upon commitments in the contract. It's important to designate one key individual who's responsible for ensuring that a service provider is meeting its contractual obligations. For example, has the vendor delivered the expected number of workstations within the schedule that was outlined in the contract? With regular monitoring, any shortcomings can be detected and corrected before the system is implemented. After the system is implemented, additional terms of the contract must be monitored. These include, for example, turnaround times for the resolution of equipment failures, repairs, or system problems, and timely provision of education and training on new product releases. Customer satisfaction surveys are also an integral part of any healthcare organization's strategy to maintain loyalty among customers and continually improve customer satisfaction levels. Surveys are an effective tool used to gain feedback about services provided by IT staff to clinicians and others in the organization. Here are examples of typical questions that are asked as part of a customer satisfaction survey from a health IT help desk. The responses are used to gauge the level of satisfaction with issue resolution and also to monitor the help desk representative's knowledge and helpfulness from the perspective of the customer. Survey results can then be used to provide positive feedback to an individual for a job well done, or the results may identify areas for improvement for the help desk knowledge base and for the staff. Now let's look at the two most common go-live strategies for health IT implementations and the implications for health IT customer service. Big Bang and Phased are two strategies used for implementing IT systems. These approaches can be used for implementation of a new health IT system, migration from an existing system to a new one, and improvements to an existing system. These strategies are also relevant to other IT projects, such as integrating with patient portals and adopting telehealth devices. Big Bang is an organizational approach that implements a system or integrates a new capability at one designated date and time. An example of a Big Bang implementation would be, starting at one minute after midnight on November 16th, the new EHR becomes live at all sites of XYZ Health and the old system is no longer used. Another example would be the implementation of a new mobile application that allows secure transmission of EKGs and video between EMS, or Emergency Medical Services, and Emergency Department, ED, physicians. An important consideration when deciding whether to use a Big Bang approach is how many sites are involved. Consider the difference between an implementation for only one site and one that must be completed across several sites simultaneously for a Big Bang. In the EMS-ED example, the project would entail the training of EMS staff in many different locations and shifts on the new application in time for go-live. The complexity and risk are certainly increased in the latter scenario. Phased implementation occurs, as you can guess, when implementations of a new system, changes to an existing system, or new functionality occur in a planned sequence rather than all at once, as is done with the Big Bang approach. With the phased approach, the old system, old IT system or old paper-based manual process, 
must be maintained and supported until all of the phases are completed. This approach creates a need for dual business processes, user documentation, and so on during the interim period. Also, from the perspective of resources, such as financial, staffing, time, and services, there is typically a longer commitment with the phased approach. In our example, if the goal for the IT department is to ultimately remove fax machines and associated phone lines, then the implementation of the EMS mobile application using a phased approach would require the support of dual processes for an extended time period. IT would need to continue to support the current process of faxing EKGs to the emergency department and simultaneously support the use of the secure mobile application. However, on the positive side, the phased approach can lead to earlier adoption of new technology and capabilities. Suppose the EMS locations within 10 miles of the hospital are targeted as the first phase, and this group represents the majority of the ambulance service to the emergency department. This approach could be a significant win for all concerned, patients, clinicians, EMS professionals, and IT, because the first phase would be more manageable than a big bang for IT, yet most of the IT customers would be served in the earliest phase of the go-live. The go-live strategy an organization selects also has some associated implications for health IT customer service. Let's consider how customers could be impacted by a go-live strategy that's used to change from one EHR system to another due to a recent merger with another health organization. First, consider patients. Will their medical histories, such as medications, allergies, office visits, radiology studies, and lab results, be available in the new system upon go-live? With the Big Bang approach, the answer is yes. In contrast, with the phased approach, medical information might become accessible in the different systems over an extended period of time. The hospital may be transitioned to the new system during the first phase, and the outpatient ambulatory clinics may be transitioned at a later phase. This period, when the hospital and clinics are not yet synchronized, may impact the patient's experience in obtaining medical records and scheduling appointments, for example. Physicians wonder, will my colleagues and I be entering orders for all of our patients in the new system by a single date and time? This would be the case with the Big Bang approach. With a phased approach, certain specialties, say cardiology for example, will be live on the new system before others. Nurses may ask, will all nursing staff, for example those in the emergency department, inpatient care, and critical care, be utilizing the same system at Go Live? They would all be using the same system with the Big Bang approach. With a phased approach, the system they use will depend on the date, their location, or their area or service. With the Big Bang approach, if the IT help desk receives reports of a problem with the EHR system that's impacting the performance of the network, they'll assume that the problem is affecting all locations. If the IT help desk receives this kind of report during a phased approach, They'll want to find out which areas, such as cardiology clinics, are affected and which EHR system is impacted, the old or new system. Let's look at the factors that are important to the success of a customer service-driven health IT implementation. It's important to include your customer in the implementation process and to continually reinforce the reasons the change is being implemented. Spending time learning about customer needs can help IT staff to articulate relevant benefits. For physicians, this may mean reiterating that a particular IT project is being undertaken to improve the quality of care. For example, the implementation of telehealth devices at remote primary care offices may initially be intimidating for the physicians and staff. However, explaining how the technology will improve their patient access to care and care coordination can reduce negative attitudes toward the transition. Nurses look to the incorporation of technology to save them time so they can focus on their patients. For example, with a new EHR system, initially documenting a patient's visit will take more time. However, when that patient returns six weeks or six months later, that supporting documentation, such as prior visit history, home medication lists, allergy information, will already be available in the record. For nurses who do the bulk of documentation on a patient, the reward will be in the increased efficiency that occurs later when the information is readily available and doesn't have to be re-entered. The integration of technology to monitor patient vital signs and automatically notify the caregiver when abnormal vital signs occur 
will be seen as a success factor for nurses and also address patient safety. Administrators, too, must be reminded that their investment in health IT systems and technology is worth it. They will want to know exactly when they should expect to see a return on their investment. When can they get the reports promised by the system? When can they start doing a comparative analysis of physicians using the new system? When can they use the information in the system to generate more targeted advertising campaigns? Also, be sure to let patients know how they benefit from the implementation of a new IT system or integration of technology. Remember that the needs of patients and their families also drive the implementation of technology in health IT-related areas. This is certainly the case with patient portals that offer online scheduling, secure communication with their care providers, and mobile applications for management of health conditions, such as blood sugar monitoring. All of these services can contribute to success by increasing customer satisfaction. Another factor that determines the success of a health IT implementation is whether all customers or stakeholders are pleased with the outcome. Keep in mind that the satisfaction for different groups may come at different times. Eventually, however, every customer base should reap some sort of a reward. Let's look at possible success factors for this example. Integration of a telehealth device at a primary care physician or PCP practice with an EHR system at a nearby hospital. For patients, the use of a blood sugar monitoring device could lead to decreased need to travel to specialists' offices. Consistency of shared information and ease of communication between their PCP and specialists are another plus. Likewise, the PCPs could view the ability to securely document and share information between their clinic and specialists at the hospital as a time saver that increases their productivity and improves quality of care for their patients. For nurses at the PCP's office, there may be more technical tasks involved, but as long as the tasks are incorporated into the nurse's workflow and don't interfere with their patient care duties, then they would likely view the telehealth device as a success. Also, over time, the hospital administrator may see a decrease in the number of admissions for patients with diabetes who are part of the telehealth initiative. Every person who's impacted by the change in any way will need to be included in the implementation plan. Because much of customer service is about the perceived quality of the service being provided, you'll want to carefully guide users through an implementation. Also, be sure to communicate with them early and often and publicize successes, large or small. One of the best things a project manager can do is have a communication liaison who both educates stakeholders and communicates project status throughout the entire project lifecycle. Sometimes customer service is all about bringing people into the loop as often and as early as possible. Doing so increases the likelihood that they'll be comfortable with the level of change in their normal routines. Also, stress levels tend to go up during an implementation. Keeping the atmosphere positive and calm goes a long way toward influencing the perception of the service being provided and the view of the system or change itself. This concludes customer service in health IT. In summary, customer service can be measured by using service-driven metrics that are key to providing quality services to customers and supporting successful health IT implementations.